Hello everyone and welcome to the Pilecki Institute. Today we are commemorating the 80th anniversary of the Vansi Conference on the 20th of January 1942. I've got with me today Dr Nicholas Terry who is a senior lecturer in modern European history at the University of Exeter and he's also the founder of the Anti-Denial blog. Welcome Dr Terry. Hello, welcome. Really looking forward to this. It's going to be a very interesting talk uh, about the Vansi Conference because this year is it's, it's 80 years since it happened. Mm -hmm. Indeed. I mean, it's going to be a, quite a year for anniversaries for the Holocaust um, in, you know, 80 years after 1942. But certainly kind of this is the first really, really big one. Do you know what? I think I'm going to kick off with, uh, with a statement. Um, this is going to provoke a few people, but I want to get a good answer out of this. So the statement is... The final solution was decided and planned at the Vonsi conference. Talk to me, is there any truth to the statement? None whatsoever. Um, clearly, any decision for the final solution must have taken, taken place before that day, because Hitler wasn't there, Himmler wasn't there. This was a meeting chaired by the head of the Reich Security Main Office, Reinhard Heydrich, um, and he brought together not like a cabinet meeting, this was the deputies, the state secretaries of the German ministries. Um, he wanted to coordinate and, and, and you, know, imp, you know, assert his authority um, over, the, over Jewish policy, over the final solution towards the rest of the Nazi bureaucracy. So the decision, everybody agrees, all the historians who've really looked at this in any detail agree, must have taken place before the 20th of January 1942. We'll talk about that, I'm sure, later. As to whether it, the final solution was planned at Van Zee, well, if we go back almost, hmm, what is it, 70 years, to one of the first histories of the, of the final solution by the British historian Gerald Reitlinger, he discussed Van Zee in a chapter which he called the Auschwitz plan. But in fact, what Heydrich uh, presented at Van Zee, well, obviously he presented a plan, but was it the final plan that they actually implemented later in 1942? No, and that is also something which I think historians have wrestled with for quite some time. And increasingly we're now realizing that what we're seeing at Van Zee is, is just a snapshot of a, of a much longer uh, decision-making process. Um, very, very telling and rather chilling snapshot, but it's still only a snapshot. Well, actually, I'm going to ask that question uh, in, a, in a few questions time, but I spent this morning watching uh, Conspiracy, which came out in, I think it was 2001, around about then. Uh, it was, I think it was produced by the... Yes. Yes, by the BBC, it was produced, if I'm not oh. mistaken. Um, so for people who don't know, who are listening in, Conspiracy is um, a kind of a film, a docu-film. I don't know how you want to really kind of describe this. Know. Something along those lines. So it's yeah. about the Vansi Conference in itself. And the conference is actually, it's what has been portrayed in TV and film, like so many times. So how accurate well let's start with the conspiracy how accurate is the conspiracy before we move on to other portrayals so we'll start with that one first well i mean it, it's it's not un inaccurate as to the location to the participants obviously it's it's great fun when you've got kenneth branner as heydrich and you've got mr darcy colin firth as the rather obscure state secretary stuckart I remember when it came out, um, watching it, and, and everybody was kind of a gulp and was like, who's this guy? We've never heard of him. Who's Stuckart? And it's like, well, that was kind of fun. And then Stanley Tucci as Eichmann and so on. So, so that was actually, you know, I mean, whatever one says about whether they really, the actors look like those people, then, then it was at least portrayed, you know, in, in a sort of vivid way. But as to what was said there, it's a while since I've seen that film. In fact, it's 20 years because I saw it when it came out on the BBC. So what do you what what was said in the, in the conspiracy movie about about the actual what they were planning to do? Because obviously they, well, they got some things right. You know what? The first thing that kind of made me take a step back was literally, I think it's maybe the second line of the narrator that uh -huh. these two hours were going to change the, I think it was something along the lines of the Holocaust or the future of people in Europe. 
that <coughs> you know it kind of it really stressed the importance of this mm -hmm. conference mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. talk to me about this how well, that's, is, is that's a really good point obviously a little bit of hyperbole to sell a movie is always a good as is always good for for marketing but there is a grain of truth to that because this was a this was a conference at which Heydrich still talked even if even if kind of we don't know precisely what was said because there isn't a a transcript of the meeting we've got like his minute his edited version of what was said but we can see in the protocol um a pretty clear set of statements which we'll no doubt talk about later which basically do do mean that they intended to kill all jews um in europe eventually um the ones that were they were going to spare for the moment for forced labor and to work they were going to work them to death and anybody who survived they were going to finish off and that obviously left complete silence about anybody who couldn't work like women you know mothers and children and the elderly they are obviously just not mentioned and that the implication is they were going to be exterminated so and this was you know i mean this was kind of a, a time when they list the numbers are not quite right they list all the countries in europe including switzerland the uk countries they've not occupied yet they just list all the all the jewish populations as as they know it some of them they get wrong it says 11 million it was under 10 really in reality they double counted in a few places but they list it and it's there and they have here's kind of much of the german state getting around a table to discuss and plan genocide. And that, I think, is, is the key thing, that this was indeed a meeting to plan genocide. There's also, uh, Yusuf Bullard was one of the ones that kind of caught my eye a little bit, because he was obviously from the, the general government. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of very, you know, let's get rid of the Jews, you know, stop sending them to us. Let's get rid of the ones we've got first. Mm -hmm. And then you can start sending the rest of them east. And that mm -hmm. was more or less his kind of stance uh, mm -hmm. within within this 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 conf well from the film. We're talking about the film, obviously, yeah. not 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 what actually happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think there's any truth in what he was saying there? Well, I mean, that's that's clearly inspired by the minuted remarks that Bula made at the Vansley conference. Um, and indeed he he did he's there quoted on the final page saying, you know, we want to be first. We basically have too many Jews, our Jews in Poland in the government general, they're mostly not fit for work, so they're not useful. Please can we get rid of them? And the interesting thing is, of course, that the Bula had actually been one of the first in the post-war era at the main international military tribunal, the main Nuremberg trial. He was there as a defense witness for the governor general, Hans Frank, and he talked about that too. And then he claimed that Heydrich had told him that all the Jews were going to be sent to Northern Russia. And it's an interesting question as to whether that was Bula lying through his teeth or whether Heydrich had in fact lied to Bula and misrepresented what exactly the SS were planning. But Bula kind of started to crack open what this, you know, to sort of put people on the trial. And then a few months, you know, that was, I think, early, mid 40, 1946 when he testified. And then December 1946, the investigators, the American investigators found the protocol in the captured German Foreign Office records. And then that came and boomerang back on him because Bula then was confronted by the Vanze protocol at his own trial in Poland in 1948. And that was found by Luth in Luther's paperwork. The sorry? protocol was it found in uh, Martin Luther's uh, yes, paperwork. Martin Luther's paperwork. So basically, it's it's now you can actually access it, download a scanned copy of the whole file uh, from the German political archive of the German Foreign Office. They've digitized all of the records of Luther's section. Um, which basically dealt with the Jewish question, all of the secret files. And so this file is called Final Solution of the Jewish Question. And it's a very interesting file because it starts before the war. It starts with plans about forced emigration. It's, it has all the key documents on 
the Madagascar plan from 1940, and it has documents from after Van Zee showing what the Foreign Office was doing. Um, and Luther had obviously been invited as the Foreign Office expert um, to this interministerial conference, which was what Van Zee was. Um, and um, so, yeah, so it was found there in his files. What's really interesting is that the Foreign Office, the German Foreign Office Archive pointed out that it was then microfilmed in Britain um, shortly afterwards before it would start to be used in the war crimes trials after the war. And then when it was copied and returned to German, West Germany, um, it got loaned out in the late 60s to a West German war crimes trial of diplomats um, who had complicity in the final solution. And the, the German state attorneys ran their red pencils over the original document. So if you ever see a scan of it, you'll see all of these underlinings that actually weren't there in the copy that Luther received um, in 1942, but actually they were written in there, they were almost vandalized. Um, so just in case anybody thinks the underlinings and the document mean anything, but actually they don't, they mean what somebody in 1968 for rather than what somebody in 1942 for. But it's, um, but it's a kind of, so that's a kind of, you know, the document itself is kind of a story all by itself, as it were, isn't it? There's, there's one more person I wanna, I wanna touch on from conspiracy. And um, only because in all honesty, I don't know if there's any truth in it or it's more to do <laughs> with artistic licensing, uh -huh. or the kind of, the possibility of making something more interesting than what actually is. And that's to do with, uh is it Kritzinger? I can't pronounce his name correctly. Yes. Yeah. So in the film, he's basically portrayed as he's absolutely horrified in what's happening. Um, I know that during his trial, he he actually denounced everything that happened during the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. But is that is there any truth in it? Do you think he was against all of this? Is there any evidence for this? Well, um, I mean, there, there, there may well be some evidence. I can't speak directly to his particular case, but what's really striking is how the participants in the conference talked about it, the few that survived, because obviously Heydrich was assassinated a few months later in Prague. Eichmann talked about it very bluntly at his own trial and interrogations in, in 1960-61. Um, but the others kind of, obviously, they kind of knew they were sitting on a very, very large bomb and they had to basically kind of waffle and deny and can claim false stories. And equally, what we know is that many of the advisors to these men, some of them were also having crises of conscience. So Mr. Darcy, Colin Firth, playing Stuttgart, Stuttgart had a desk officer, Lersner, Bernhard Lersner, who basically was the Ministry of Interior official who'd been charged of dealing with the race laws ever since the mid 1930s. And in December 1941, Lersner heard that a transport of German Jews had been deported to Riga in Latvia and had all been shot on arrival. And news of this reached Berlin. It reached people in the Catholic diocese. It reached Lersner. It reached others. They kind of, it kind of reverberated. It was like, my God, they're now killing German Jews. This has got really serious. And Lersner talked to Stuttgart and said, I'm not sure I can continue with this. This is a step too far. I was all fine if it was all about discriminating against them and then maybe deporting them somewhere. But, but we're killing them. This is too much. And Stuttgart's like, don't you know this is from the orders of the highest authority? And so Stuttgart at that moment is kind of playing hard man and his subordinate Lersner is all kind of claiming this is a step too far. So yeah, there, I'm sure, sure there were some people around that table who did have a little bit of a crisis of conscience. And there are others who obviously then realized this was something that was going to be a total tar baby. So Buhler, as I mentioned, he kind of claimed that, you know, Heydrich had said that the Jews were all going to go to Northern Russia, which 
Nuremberg, the Soviet prosecutor, turned around and said, well, you know that basically there was kind of a siege outside Leningrad. Were they all basically being done behind the front line of Leningrad? Oh, no. And he kind of realized that his bullshit was bullshit. Um, whereas there's another guy, Georg Leibrandt, who was a state secretary in the Reich Ministry for the Occupied Eastern Territories. And, and Leibrandt was in, interrogated in 1948, so the same year that Bula was put on trial, by none other than Rezo or Rudolf Kastner, who was a very controversial Jewish leader in Hungary. He was responsible for a famous kind of, he sort of was involved in negotiating and cutting deals with Eichmann, eventually was accused of collaboration in Israel. And in fact, then, you know, um, tried to sort of, he, he kind of actually won a libel trial, but then got assassinated by somebody who was so angry with him in the 50s. But Kastner in 1948 went and talked to several of the participants of Vanze. He was interested, he'd heard about it, and he, he kind of had access. So, he, you know, in his own personal papers, then these, these interviews sort of survived. And Leibrandt turned around and said, I thought all the Jews were going to the government general. So you have the guy who's in charge of the government general saying they're going to Northern Russia, and the guy who's supposed to be in charge of, of Russia and the Soviet Union saying they're going to the government general. It's like a shell game, yeah? That's basically what they were saying to, to people after the war, until Eichmann bluntly said in his interrogations, yeah, we talked about killing, and we compared and discussed methods of killing. And that's that's the one witness who survived and participant who survived who admitted what I think is obvious from the protocol that they must have discussed killing to some extent. So it took up until 1960 for someone to actually admit it. Yeah. So, yes. And I think that, you know, well, I think it's because of the Eichmann trial, because of Eichmann's admission that I think that Van Zay, he was obviously famous from 1946 to 1960 in, in specialist circles amongst the Cognoscenti, but I think that it became much more famous after the publicity it got with, with the Eichmann trial in 1961. Is there anyone else you think is worth mentioning that attended the conference? Um, well, I mean, let's not go through all of them. I always will be here all day. But I tell you the guy, he's actually the lowest ranking um, attendee. Eichmann was a lieutenant colonel in the SS, and then there's Major Langer, who was the um, commander of the security police in Latvia, who was also the commander of Einsatzkommando 2. And Langer is really interesting to, to see. He was there along with his superior, Starlecker, who actually was killed by Soviet partisans in just a month later. Um, and so he was the most junior SS officer around the table. He was in charge of the, you know, Gestapo, the Einsatzgruppen, in one small territory in Latvia, which of course is where the, the, the transport from Berlin that Lerzner had, had heard about and had shocked him had been shot. And it was where 20,000 other Jews from Germany, Austria, and, 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 and Czechia were being deported into the Riga ghetto after the Latvian Jews had been shot um, outside Riga at Rabula. Um, so tell me what it is. Is it basically that Langer was there to talk to these other guys about setting up a ghetto for Jews from Germany or setting up a camp for the Jews? Or is it he was going to talk about his experiences having participated in executing up to 60,000 Jews in Latvia? In I'd probably Latvia. say the, the experience is, is more likely, you know, because at this, yeah. at, at this stage, they were kind of, <coughs> soldiers were struggling with the Holocaust by bullets, weren't they? Mm -hmm. And they had to find a different method of they basically did. exterminating people rather than just shooting them. Well, I mean, this is it. And Heydrich had actually, you know, I mean, Himmler and Heydrich had, had knew, known that since August 1941. And then there were experiments in Minsk and, and, and Mogilev in, in Belarus, which basically tested out gassing 
uh, psychiatric patients, and that then helped influence the uh, development of gas fans. And gas fans were then sent out to the east. They were made by the right by Heydrich, by the Reich Security Main Office, the RSHA. Um, so that was kind of like the RSHA's brand. They mobilized the Einzels Gruppen so they knew how to coordinate mass shootings as like, you know, in Babi Yar in Kiev in September 41 was carried out by Sonderkommando 4A. Heydrich signed off on a medal award for the commander of that unit just the day before Van Zee. So it was pretty clear that they were going to talk about shootings, but Heydrich also could talk about gas fans. So maybe Heydrich had in his mind the idea of sending Jews to places like Riga and Minsk and then killing them in, in, with gas fans, which happens to 17,000 Jews, mainly from Austria, sometimes some from Germany and, and Czechia, in 1942, outside Minsk, at the camp of Mali Trotsinets, where there was no gas chamber of a static kind. There were just gas vans. It's the seventh extermination camp. It's the one that very few people have heard of. But that was all in-house, as far as, far as Heydrich was concerned. It was all within the RSHA, within the Gestapo, within the security police. So, whether he talked about other options is another question, but he certainly would have talked about what the experiences they had with shootings and almost certainly at least at the very least with gas fans. And so Buhler and Leibrandt and others must have, they, they undoubtedly lied. Um, and as I said, otherwise, well, you know, why is this lowly major there? What's he doing? He must be giving a briefing of some kind. And yet his name, there is no comment from him in the minutes that's written up. He's just listed as one of the attendees. And so there are a lot of people who are silent participants that we don't hear from in the minutes. And obviously we can, you know, we can speculate and we can infer and we can you know, not guess, but we have more knowledge. We don't have to just guess, but we don't know for sure. I think obviously that's one of the reasons why it's, you know, there is still so much interest in it is because it's one of those things that you can interpret in a number of ways, but within that, you still will come to the conclusion, whatever your take on Vance is, but it is about genocide. I mean, we've touched on some of this already, uh, some mm -hmm. of the goals of the conference, but were there any more goals of the conference? And what role did the others play in this? I mean, some of these departments, to me, if you look at the list, for example, mm -hmm. you'd think, well, what's the, what's the point of um, the mm -hmm. Ministry of Foreign Affairs being there, for example? Can you give well, us some examples, talk us through some of this? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the Ministry of the Foreign Office was there to coordinate um, securing deals with Germany's allies, the Axis states, who to persuade them to hand over their Jews from Slovakia, from Hungary, from Romania, from Italy. All of these were sovereign states. And it's a really key thing in terms of how the Holocaust and the final solution unfolds thereafter is that the, the greatest losses, the highest percentage are of Jews murdered in any country are in those territories which are fully controlled by the Germans. So in Poland, so in the Soviet Union, and paradoxically also in the Netherlands. Whereas anywhere else, if there was even a glimmer of sovereignty, if there was even a glimmer of independent power, if the Nazis had to um, respect those national interests and concerns for whatever reason, then that could end up saving lives because those, those, those sovereign states or semi-sovereign states could potentially throw sand in the gears of, of the machinery of death. So Vichy France is a really good example. 75,000 Jews were deported from France. Very few of them were French citizens. Most of them were foreign, uh, foreign, foreign Jews, many from Poland, many from Romania, many from Hungary. Um, the Vichy government refused. Petain, for all the fact that he'd admit, allowed and, 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 and permitted later the Germans to round up and deport these, these foreign nationals, 
he, he drew the line at his own citizens. Romania is another example. Romania had murdered over a quarter of a million Jews by the spring of 42, all by itself, with very little help from the Germans. But when the Foreign Office came to Romania to sort out the transfer, the handing over of Jews from the core of Romania, they got as far as drawing up the train timetables. Romanian Jews were going to go to Belgium um, and um, in, in the government general, they weren't going to be sent to Auschwitz because there was too many of them. And, um, and then, you know, so they got, you know, had a conference to plan the trains. And then Antonescu, the Romanian leader, changed his mind because he felt that his national pride and amour propre had been offended by German, um, you know, the sort of arrogance of the Germans. And also maybe, because this was the start of October 42, that he maybe had a glimmer that maybe they weren't going to win. And that's kind of what influenced a lot of the other Axis states, Italy, you know, they kind of, Mussolini and his, his bureaucrats dragged their feet. And then eventually it became clear that they didn't want to hand over any Jews. Likewise in Hungary, they didn't, the, the Prime Minister of Hungary at this time, Kalai, just would not accept and go along with the Nazi demands. And it wasn't until Nazi Germany occupied Hungary in March 44, and there was a change of government, that suddenly the Holocaust in Hungary became fully possible. Um, obviously, some Hungarian Jews had been killed earlier by the Hungarians, by the Germans in, in different situations in parts of Greater Hungary. But it was it was so there was a kind of diplomatic dimension to all of this that had to be coordinated um, through the Foreign Office. But one thing about the goals of the conference, this has kind of been discussed and disputed because a lot of this discussion in the protocol is actually about deciding who is a Jew. They are still unsure what they're going to do with the so-called Mischlinger, the mixed part, part Jews who've been defined by the Nuremberg laws for half Jews and quarter Jews. Some of the participants clearly wanted to include more of the Jew, Mischlinger and the mixed Jews in the final solution, but most then, well, he's a half Jew, he's half Jewish, but he's also half German. We've got to basically try to do something with that German part. We can't, you know, just kill them. But instead, and this is one of the great big clanging clues in the protocol, just explaining why it does basically is about genocide, is the kind of consensus at that time is that the Mischlinger, the part Jews, they won't be deported to the East, but they should be sterilized so they can't pass on any of their Jewish blood to another generation. And that I think is, is I mean, it's, you know, it fits completely with our understanding of what genocide means, but it's about stopping a people from, from living, from, from continuing. If you sterilized an entire population and didn't kill them, then within a generation, just like in the film Children of Men, you know, they would all die out and that would they would be would, would be wiped out. So some historians like Christian Gerlach argue that because one of the things about Vanze is it was originally scheduled for early in December 1941 and it got postponed. The question is why? <clears throat> was it simply because America had, had been attacked by Japan at Pearl Harbor and now Germany had declared war, declared war on America and all of that mattered? Or was it because a more fundamental decision had been taken by Hitler? And so the, the German historian Christian Gerlach argued in a really, really brilliant essay um, in the 1990s that actually Hitler had announced his decision to destroy the Jewish race in Europe at a meeting after he declared war on the United States on the 12th of December 1941. We know about this meeting from the diaries of the propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels. Um, and he wrote this down, and that, 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 that particular part of the diary had been found in, in the Russian archives after the, the collapse of communism, so it hadn't been known before the 1990s. 
And it's one of the most blunt statements from Hitler. And he's very, very clear that he's talking now my prophecy, which he'd first made all the way back in January 1939, threatening that if a world war was to break out and you, you know, a war, you know, a, a world war was to break out, but it wouldn't be the Aryan race who'd be extirpated. It would be the, it would result in a destruction of the Jewish race in Europe. And Hitler had been repeating this prophecy all the way at several occasions through 1941. And Goebbels and others had also parroted Hitler. They kept on referring back to it. The prophecy in the film uh, of Hitler giving his speech in 1939 was actually included in the anti-Semitic propaganda film, The Eternal Jew, The Ewige Jude, in which was released in late 1940. It's the film that basically kind of juxtaposes footage from the Warsaw Ghetto with images of the rats scurrying around sewers. And it's kind of obviously linking Jews and rats. It's very, very, you know, exterminatory and kind of eliminationist in its sort of, um, in its presentation and it ends with Hitler repeating his prophecy. So, you know, Hitler, from, from Hitler's point of view, he'd been threatening the world war, if it's gonna break out, it's all the fault of the Jews. Well, now world war had broken out. And certainly there are many, many other sources, um, both several contemporary documents, uh, reports by Hans Frank, the governor general, by Alfred Rosenberg, the minister for the Eastern Territories, lots and lots and lots of SS men who testified saying, yeah, we were doing this with the Jews and then it got to December 41 and everything changed. And so something clearly had changed. So what I'm just going to throw something in the hat here. So I'm assuming yeah. you are not in the Christopher Browning camp or in the Lucy Davidovich camp. <laughs> no, um, I'm not sure if anybody's in the Lucy Davidovich camp um, for claiming that Hitler had always wanted to exterminate the Jews from, from the very beginning. There's no question that Hitler's anti-Semitism, if you read the chapter, People and Race in Mein Kampf, then it's, it's one would come away, if you believed his nonsense, thinking that the Jews were total monsters and, uh, you know, just, just beyond dangerous. Um, and of course, what he's repeating and claiming in his chapter is, is a load of waffle. Um, so yes, Hitler was a, was a, was a bone-deep anti-Semite from a very early stage. Um, and over time, then one can find a variety of statements from different Nazis that occasionally, you know, threaten extermination, talk about the desirability of killing Jews, or most often, especially after the uh, invasion of Poland, the, the Nazis seem happy before 1942 to just sort of let the Jews croak, to let them starve to death in a ghetto, don't they are indifferent, at, you know, at best to the, the value of Jewish life. They don't see Jews as human beings. But if Gerlach's right, well, that still leaves us with the question of why then did Heydrich invite everybody to a conference in Vanze in November 41? If it wasn't about planning the extermination of the Jews, then what was it about? <coughs> well, Gerlach answered, and I think there's some truth to this, um, more than some truth, that basically it was about regulating and deciding who was to be deported because Hitler had authorized the deportation of Jews from Germany, from the Reich, from Austria, from Czechia, the protectorate of Bohemia Moravia, um, in September 1941. So Himmler told the Gauleiter of the Vartigau in, 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 in Lodz. Um, apologies for my mispronunciation there. Um, in September 1941, that the Lodz ghetto was going to receive 60,000 Jews from the Reich. They was cut down to 20,000, they started arriving. Those Jews from Germany weren't exterminated until May 1942 when they were deported to Kalno after the Polish Jews in the Lodz ghetto had been deported from the start of January 1942, so actually before Vanzo. 
Um, and other German Jews were being deported to Minsk, to Riga, and some of them were being killed on arrival and some were being held in ghettos. So there were a whole load of bureaucratic issues that were involved. The um, Reich bureaucracy had only just agreed a new ordinance, the 11th ordinance of, of the Nuremberg laws, stripping Jews of citizenship, uh, making them stateless if they left the German borders. So if you deport them outside Germany, now they're stateless and you can take their property and give it to the state. <coughs> but this was the end of a process going all the way back to 1940, where all the same people or ministries that had been involved in Banzé were arguing over defining citizenship, over defining the rights and statuses of both Poles and Jews, because Himmler and the SS were busily trying to um, turn quite a, uh, a proportion of the Polish population into Germans on the German people's list. And so if the Poles who weren't forced to become German um, were to be treated with a different status, that necessarily meant the Jews should be given a worse status. So the Nazis had been discussing this and expecting some kind of mass deportation of German Jews for over a year before Vanze, but it just wasn't going to happen straight away. Barbarossa, the war in the Soviet Union, and other things got in the way and delayed it. But now in the autumn of 41, it was happening. And so the question is whether basically at what point did the Nazi leadership and Hitler decide that they were going to exterminate all Jews? Christopher Browning, you mentioned, argues very vigorously that Hitler had taken this decision at the start of October 1941. It's kind of funny. I mean, I grew up reading Browning's long career of, of works and studies, debating this, 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 the origins of the final solution and arguing this very consistently, bringing in more and more and more evidence. And, and I, I think it's so foundational. It's, it's, it's still worth reading. But I'm not sure if anybody agrees with him now, um, uh, which is, you know, he's, he broke paths, but I think that everybody agrees that it was probably more of a, either something that spread uh, over a longer period, or it was indeed, as Galak says, decided in December 1941. Um, and... Um, what I would sort of say is that we, we sort of more and more historians are sort of distinguishing between which group of Jews are then being consigned to extermination. The first group obviously are Soviet Jews, Jews in the Soviet Union, the escalation after the start of Barbarossa in the summer of 1941 had condemned them essentially to death. And by the autumn of 41, the systematic extermination of Soviet Jews is taking place across um, and, and behind the Eastern Front. With Polish Jews, obviously bearing in mind that they're split between the government general, the Wartegau, and other regions, historians would are uh, conflicted. Browning argued that a decision to kill the Jews of the government general had been taken in late October 41. Most other historians disagree and say actually this wasn't take this decision wasn't taken until after Hans Frank had listened to Hitler make his definitive statement about the destruction of the Jewish race in Europe and came back and on the 16th of December 1941 he told his cabinet we've got to liquidate them ourselves and he didn't know how the they were going to do that the ss had plans and and, and options um, ready but he himself had not clearly made that decision because he was also talking in november 41 in speeches very sincerely about expelling the Jews of Poland a thousand kilometers to the east into the Soviet Union. So this would have been almost like the Armenian genocide where the Ottoman state expelled 
the Armenians into the Syrian deserts and just expecting them all to sort of die of natural causes. But we know that in the Vatagal, Greiser had secured permission by October 41 to reduce the Jewish population of the Vatagal by 100,000 unfit Jews, and they were to be killed in Kelmno using gas vans. And so this is quite striking because it means that Hitler, as far as we know, had not really needed to be involved in a decision to kill up to 100,000 people. That was something that Himmler and Greiser could decide between themselves because it fulfilled the aims of Germanization, of making the territory more Jew-free, um, which was obviously a Nazi goal. Um, just as in the Soviet Union, um, the local SS commanders could decide to escalate and to murder more and more people. But to kill German Jews, even if you had made them stateless, even if you were excoriating them and blaming them for everything and regarding them as, as a source of all evil, that was a step that was going to be controversial. Too many of them had relatives or friends amongst the German population. The bureaucracy wanted to dot, it, dot its I's and cross its T's. They wanted everything to be all, you know, tied up with a bow. And I think that's basically what Heydrich originally wanted to discuss is, so who are we deporting? Are we deporting the over 65s? because some of the early transports for left for lots did include pensioners, or should we maybe be a bit more generous and send them somewhere nice-ish, like Theresienstadt, the ghetto for the elderly? Um, and obviously that was a decision that they were starting to take, and that was what they then implemented in 1942. They spared Jew German Jews and Austrian Jews who were over 65. There was no such concession and no such mercy to Dutch Jews or Polish Jews. Yeah. Looking into the subject, I, I want to know because we're now touching after the Vonsi conference. I want to know, did they actually end up sticking to the plan in the end? Well, no. And that's what makes the Vanze Protocol so fascinating. It, it's, as I said earlier, it's a snapshot. It, you know, the crucial lines talk about combing Europe from west to east which never happened because they started in the East and then they didn't get to the West until July, 1942. Um, and to deport the Jews to the East where they would be sent road building to the East. The able-bodied Jews would be sent road building to the East. <clears throat> and they expected as a result of all the harsh forced labor doing that, that they would die and be diminished and then they would finish off whoever survived because if they didn't kill off the survivors, they would be the seeds of a biological revival of world Jewry, yeah? So this is kind of something that the Nazis kept on referring to, but they, they in striking at the Jews of Poland, they were cutting off the wellspring, the biological wellspring of world Jewry because they saw that as where the Jewish population was coming from across the world. They would grow, the birth rate would, 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 would extend, and they would emigrate to France, to America, everywhere else. They had to finish off the Jews of Poland to get rid of the Jews in the long term. But this road building to the East line actually reflects plans of the SS to deploy Jews in Ukraine. So the SS wanted to help out with highway number four, Durchgangsstrasse 4, uh, which went all the way from through Galicia, through Pastovov, through Ukraine, all the way to um, the Black Sea. And it was going to basically be built using Jewish forced labor. And indeed, there's actually several documents now that we know of showing that before Vanze, a week before Vanze, this is a document first found by the American historian Wendy Lauer. She found a document showing that the civil authorities in the uh, Ukraine had been told to prepare ghettos for German Jews. And in the end, no Jews from Germany ever went, were deported to Ukraine, it didn't happen. 
um, but they clearly intended to send them there. And so this is also striking because at the time of Anze, as of the 20th of January 1942, there is no documentary evidence that any Jews were to be sent to Auschwitz. Um, all the documentary evidence that we can start, we can, we can point to, start the paper trail that connects the final solution to Auschwitz, the contemporary documents start after Vanze. So what was presented at Vanze was probably closer to a kind of not more decimatory final solution, that they were basically going to send Jews further east into the Soviet Union. Maybe the Einsatz Gruppen would kill off the unfit Jews or the Jews that got exhausted with shootings and gas fans. And then the survivors would be put to work building things. And that would be useful. You know, that would be still destroying the Jewish race. It just would happen probably over a longer time period. So, yeah, it, things changed. I want to talk a little bit about language, because for me, the language of, of the Holocaust, I find very fascinating. There's a um, very interesting document that used to be on, on display in the Auschwitz Museum. It's not so much anymore because obviously COVID has changed a few things here and there. But words like final solution or mm -hmm. Jewish question and in the material that was on display in the Auschwitz Museum was material for Jewish resettlement or constantly again you come up with that word resettlement I mean mm -hmm. should should we still be using this sort of language when describing the events <clears throat> of Vanessa or the Holocaust in general well um yes I think we should but we must ensure that we put them those words in inverted commas we should never we should we, this is what contemporaries did um, resettlement is one of the great cliches. It's the cover story that the Nazis stuck to um, from Van Zee onwards, because of course they had already begun programs of expulsion and resettlement inside Poland already in 1939. By 1942, when the deportations of Jews in Poland are sent to Helmnau, to Belzec, Sobibor, and then Treblinka, and to Auschwitz, uh, Birkenau, the Polish underground, the Jewish underground in Poland, they are always putting resettlement. Wyszedlenia, uh, I think, is kind of, that's probably my bad pronunciation. Wyszedlenia, it's okay, Vichedlenia. don't worry, you'll be forgiven. Anyway, but basically resettlement and action they're always put into adverse commas and all of the reports and so many of the diaries that what does an action mean? What does resettlement mean? They mean death. And basically the Poles and the Jews in Poland both see through this fiction that the Nazis are trying to sell um, and also the fiction that the Nazis are trying to sell to themselves because it's a lot easier psychologically if you're a German official, if you're a civil servant, if you're a policeman, to be told you're participating in a resettlement program than to be told you're participating in mass murder. So resettlement is, is it's contemporary, it's faithful to the times, but only if we keep the inverted commas. And likewise, final solution. I mean, I think obviously the term final solution, it, it's not um, a synonym for the Holocaust as a whole, because parts of the persecution and murder of the Jews took place before the final solution is decided and or were carried out by Axis states like Croatia and Romania. And Jews obviously died um, in the concentration camps in 1945 after the final solution has technically been ended in October 1944 when the gas chambers at Auschwitz are, 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 are closed and when they're, when they're dismantled. So um, final solution, of course, is a term that had changed its meaning for the Nazis. For most of the war, um, from really from 1940 onwards at least, it did mean a territorial solution. 
there are occasional uses of of it in in a, in a broader context within essentially you know talking about solving the jewish question which was how they always talked about it um inside germany inside the reich but as soon as they'd acquired a european empire then the talk of the final solution of the jewish question in europe was raised and obviously that was when in mid 1940 the uh, Madagascar plan was evolved. They, they planned to ship out all of the Jews of Europe over a many a multi-year period to the tropical island of, of Madagascar, essentially leaving Jews to be exposed to tropical diseases. And if they will die there, that was fine with the Germans. And then in early 1941, Madagascar was not feasible because Britain was still in the war, France, um you know couldn't just sort of hand over madagascar to to um to to germany um it wasn't feasible they couldn't guess at it there were too many the royal navy and then soon enough the american navy would have would have stopped this in the process so with the plans to invade the soviet union nazi intentions clearly went further east they were talking about expelling jews to siberia to northern russia they never got to Siberia, they never got to the Arctic Circle. But as I said earlier, they stuck to this and they stuck to this even after that day, thinking about deporting resettlement to the East, this great kind of, um, you know, fiction that was being repeated, that the, the trains were going to unknown destinations, which is also a phrase you see all in, 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 the, in the Polish reports. In yes, I was because I've been working on a, a on a big volume of works during the editing process. And funnily oh. enough, that is something that keeps coming into an unknown destination. They've been and, and taken it's again, into, put in adverse commas. Exactly. All the time I keep seeing this same phrase and now it completely and utterly makes sense. I mean, obviously, in, in those early reports in 1942, they didn't necessarily know um at that particular moment where some trains were going to they could work it out quickly but oh it's in this region so they must be going to Belzec they must be going to Kalna and then obviously the reports start filling in those details but then they say yes they're not going to and then they start using it ironically and and, and, and kind of knowing with that distance and, and kind of irony that the Nazis are lying this is basically what um there was a memoir by a German forester who supplied the camp of Kelmnor with firewood to burn the bodies, Heinz Mai. And he wrote a memoir in Ger back when he was back in Germany after the Wartegau had been overrun and, and liberated and, and returned to Poland. Um, and he called it the Great Lie. And I think that kind of almost sums up what is almost the essence of the final solution, but it's about lies and about deception and about secrecy. So yes, I think we should use those terms, but I think that we need to be careful and think about the language and realize that this was, was, was malicious, mendacious uh, language. Um, I've got one last question, actually, just to sum all of this up. I think this is a two part question. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read the whole question anyway, and then uh, we, we can answer it as we go along. So the first part of the question is, how important is the Vansi conference in a collective memory? And why is it so significant in studying and researching the Holocaust? <clears throat> well, this is a good two part question. I think that the collective memory of Ante is, is, as I said earlier, I think it, it, it sort of, it was always seen as important, you know, have, as I, as I mentioned, Hungarian, you know, Zionist leaders like Kastner wanting to find out more about it. Back already in 1948, people in the 50s who were writing earlier, uh, the early writers about the Holocaust certainly discussed it, certainly saw it as important. But then after the Eichmann trial, because it ushered in Eichmann's main job of coordinating the deportations of Jews and the final solution across the whole of Europe, then it acquired a greater resonance because it was, you know, proof positive um, of, of the intent of, of the Nazi regime to carry out genocide across Europe. And also because Eichmann had freely admitted that they had indeed talked about killing. And 
And it wasn't just some resettlement scheme or fiction. And I think that over time, um, you know, it's the House of the Vanze Conference. I was there almost 20 years, not 19 and a half years ago, I believe, um, visited when I visited Berlin. Um, and um, it, you know, eventually was turned into a museum. One obviously of many museums and memorials in and around Berlin to, to the Holocaust and to Nazi concentration camps and Nazi crimes. But um, I think that its significance emerges because of the way that in popular culture it was also repeated, not just in the film Conspiracy in 2001, it was given it was woven into the novel and, and TV miniseries by Herman Wouk uh, called War and Remembrance. The novel came out in the 70s, the, the TV series at the end of the 80s, after the, the, the prequel Wins the War had been um, you know, shown on TV in, in the early 80s. And, and Herman Wouk very cleverly weaves in the Van Zee Conference into several places. He has fictional protagonists uh, who are Germans. Um, and in fact, a good German smuggles out a, a photocopy of the Vanze Protocol to an American diplomat in Switzerland. And then this boss doesn't believe the, the, the story. He says, this is too tall a tale, it's too preposterous. How, how could this possibly happen? In reality, of course, the, the Allies never saw the Vanze Protocol until after the war. So it is, it's a fictional story, but it was a very clever way of bringing it into people's attention. I think that because it's also an interest, it's a, it's a sort of, you know, a decent sized document, not too long, not too short, has so much that's inside it, so many people that are listed as taking part in the conference, that then obviously historians have you know, discussed and debated it uh, almost continuously for the, for the last 40 years plus. Obviously, you know, there was still debate before that, but I think that you know, in the last sort of 40 years, it's been literally continuous every year almost. But it's sort of just become one of the um, key sources, um, recognized as one of the key sources. And of course, then is the sort of document that one can show to students, one can teach in the classroom. I've taught the Van Zee Conference. It takes about two hours to teach it um, in a seminar. And in fact, I'll be doing that later this afternoon um, because it so happens that the way my, course, my, my teaching of, of the Holocaust an occupation of Eastern Europe is, is, is structured, but I'll be, it just happens that this class has fallen on the 20th of January. It's too good not to um, take advantage of the anniversary, the 80th anniversary. I want to add something else into this because I think for Poland, it's quite significant. The Vonsi Conference is significant for us because at the end of the day, all of the sites to commemorate the Holocaust are in Poland mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And there's one site which is in Germany, mm -hmm. and that's the, the, the Vansi, it's the house that was mm -hmm. there, and that's where the initial planning, well, not the initial planning, but where it just happened. There is yeah. a site of memory that is not in Poland. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's not the only site of memory. I mean, the topography of terror, terror exhibition is located on the former um, site of the RSHA, the Gestapo offices. Um, and obviously the memorial, the Holocaust Memorial elsewhere is, is, you know, representing in a more abstract way. But it is the kind of, you know, the House of the Vanzee Conference, like the topography of terror, has been at the forefront in Germany, um, especially after reunification, in, in kind of promoting this kind of awareness of the Holocaust, um, promoting and propagating the, 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 you know, memory culture um which 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 um you know germany very much is, is is committed to um i think that it's it's very striking because obviously um i you know the the, the significance of anze for poland um it isn't just i think in the in the fact that the nazis eventually abandoned this plan to deport jews further east and settle on deporting uh, the Jews from Western Europe to Auschwitz and, and then turning Auschwitz into one of the main centers of the final solution. 
it's it's actually also i think i mean probably there are i mean i, I you know I, probably there are places in in poland where vanze should be given more prominence it's very striking i'm not sure how well known it is but the second time the vanze protocol was used in any war crimes trial was in poland in the supreme national tribunal um trial of josef bula hans frank's deputy um and the prosecutor of, of this trial was totally confident that he could nail Bula. He told one of the survivors of the Krakow ghetto, Mitek Pampa, who was, I think, involved in translating and interpreting as well, this is our secret weapon. We have the Vanze Protocol. We will get him. This is so clear cut. We have got the evidence that we can use to convict this guy. And so, you know, like I think, you know, I think the Polish Supreme National Tribunal trials, I wish they were better known outside of Poland and I wish outside of specialist historians, because I think that they actually, they've been called Poland's Nuremberg. And I think that in, in you know, looking at them now, they're, they're some of the most significant investigations of the Holocaust that, that were done in the 1940s. And thanks to the Americans copying the Vanze Protocol, the Poles, the Polish investigators had it and they used it. Um, so, it, you know, I think should be remembered in Poland. I think that's a good mission for the Institute to translate these documents and make them more accessible to, yeah. um, to academics and historians all around the world. Well, it's, it's very good with the Pilecki, the, the Chronicles of Terror website contains quite a few of the witness statements from the Supreme National Tribunal trials. Um, but there are definitely other documents in those files, in those case files, that, that could be added and, and should be accessible because, because I mean, you know, they, 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 they're, there are some striking gems um, of, of, of sources that, that were found, yes. I know the directors will be listening, so I'll make sure that they get this message that, that we, <laughs> we start doing something like this. But Dr. Terry, thank you so much for joining me. This has been enlightening, interesting. I have learned so many new things and I hope everybody who's listening today has learned something new from this conversation. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you.